Hello everyone, just before we get started, I do want to say that this is going to be a pronunciation nightmare. There are people in this video whose names I try to look up and there's just no guides on pronunciations anywhere, so apologies ahead of time, it's going to be a mess, but let's jump in. At first it seems like a coup by numbers. Another replay of the incidents that have recently roiled West Africa. On July the 26th, the president of Niger was placed under house arrest. An Air Force colonel appeared on television to announce a transfer of power. A curfew was declared, borders were closed, and anti-hunta protests were violently suppressed. In short, it appeared to be a classic military takeover, a power grab that would place Niger on the same path as neighbors Burkina Faso and Mali. One that would cause international ripples, but no major waves. But it quickly became apparent that this was not an ordinary coup, that Niger was qualitatively different from its military-ruled neighbors in one major respect, that outside countries were willing to intervene to restore democracy. In the immediate aftermath of the hunter's takeover, the Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, issued an ultimatum to Niger's military. Stand down or risk armed intervention. At the time of recording, that's Wednesday, August the 9th, that threat still remains. A threat that could either see democracy restored to Niger or a conflagration that will affect the entire world. So in today's episode of War of Graphics, we're going to dig into the causes and the consequences of Niger's coup d'etat and how it could impact nations as diverse as Nigeria, France, and even America. When Air Force Colonel Major Amadou Abdramane appeared on an unscheduled broadcast on national TV on the 26th of July 2023, you could tell what he was going to say before he even opened his mouth. Flanked by men in military fatigues, Abdramane announced that Niger's democratically elected government had been removed from power. The constitution had been suspended. That a new military junta, known as the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland, would now be calling the shots. For citizens of Niger, it was a dramatic end to an already dramatic day. Just hours earlier, the commander of the nation's presidential guard, General Abdurrahmane Tachani, had launched what he called an anti-republican demonstration against his boss. Now that boss, President Mohamed Bazoum, was under arrest. Two days later, the hunter announced that General Tachiani was Niger's new leader. In many ways, it was a moment of supreme irony. As head of the presidential guard, Tichiani's job for over a decade had been to thwart the exact sort of coup that he was now leading. As recently as March 2021, he'd busted a military plot against Bazoum. In return, Bazoum had given Tichiani an award to celebrate the general's loyalty. Presumably, while Tichiani tried his best not to snort with laughter. Yet, for all it might have been bleakly ironic, Tichiani's coup was also just bleak. When Bazoum assumed the presidency following elections in 2021, it marked the first peaceful democratic transfer of power in Niger's history. A history dominated by multiple coups, multiple hunters, and a whole lot of chaos. Now it seemed like that chaos was returning. When anti-coup demonstrators took to the streets of the capital, Niamey, the presidential guard brutally cracked down. Pro-coup demonstrators, meanwhile, attacked the French embassy while waving Russian flags. To be clear, there's no suggestion Moscow had engineered the takeover. As will hopefully become obvious as this video progresses, Russian flags in Niger are used more as anti-Western symbols than a sign of fealty to Vladimir Putin. Still, Russian plot or not, the removal of President Bazoum sent shockwaves through the West. The EU immediately stopped all monetary support for Niger, a big deal given that foreign aid accounts for 40% of the nation's budget. The United States warned the junta that it was putting hundreds of millions of dollars at risk. France went even further, slashing development assistance, even as President Emmanuel Macron issued stern warnings about what would happen if any French citizens were harmed. Yet for all the hunter may have used these statements to paint Paris and Washington as unrepentant colonialists, it wasn't from the West that the biggest reaction came. At least, not the West in the geopolitical sense. Instead, it fell to ECOWAS to channel the greater sense of outrage. The economic community of West African states, ECOWAS comprises 15 countries which have been pursuing greater economic integration and connectedness since 1975, a sort of African version of the European Union. The group's official website lists their members as Benin, Burkina Faso, Cape Verde, Côte d'Ivoire, the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Senegal, and Togo. Although, we should point out that Mali and Burkina Faso are currently suspended. Importantly, ECOWAS is more than just an economic community. It's also a military power, one that has a track record of interventions in its neighborhood. And it's here that we get to the crux of today's video. On July the 30th, ECOWAS issued General Tichiani and his hunter an ultimatum. Step down voluntarily or risk an armed conflict with the bloc's forces. 
it's an ultimatum that may wind up casting not just Niger or even Africa into turmoil, but the entire world. It was January 2017, and President Yahya Jammeh of the Gambia's luck had finally run out. A month earlier, a shock election victory had seen the longtime autocrat lose power to newcomer Adama Barrow. But being the sort of guy who gets described as a longtime autocrat, Jamer had responded by annulling the results and deploying the army. Yet, this had only helped extend his rule by a few weeks, because as 2017 got underway, the regional bloc his nation was a part of was humming into action. Along the borders of the Gambia, 7,000 troops were massing, 7,000 well-trained and well-equipped soldiers with a simple mission – to remove President Jamer from power and restore democracy in ECOWAS's smallest member. The most recent intervention undertaken by ECOWAS, the 2017 mission in the Gambia, is also one of the bloc's most celebrated. Outgunned and outnumbered, Jamer's troops refused to fight. The president fled into exile and democracy was restored without any blood being spilt. Yet while it's perhaps the best known, the 2017 intervention isn't the only time ECOWAS has deployed troops. In the 33 years since 1990, ECOWAS has conducted five other major interventions in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea-Bissau, Côte d'Ivoire, and Mali. On top of that, they've also sent their combined forces on stabilization missions. Right now, 600 ECOWAS soldiers are in Guinea-Bissau to keep the peace following a failed coup attempt in 2022. In other words, this is a regional bloc not averse to using hard power, a fact made possible by the presence of Nigeria, a country which, according to Deutsche Welle, can boast 223,000 military personnel as well as modern fighter jets and armed helicopters. All of which makes ECOWAS's reaction to the Niger coup more important than anything happening in Washington or Paris or even in the headquarters of the African Union. And ECOWAS's reaction so far has been a hardline refusal to accept the new junta. Aside from the ultimatum and threat of military action, the bloc responded to General Tichiani's takeover with a raft of sanctions seemingly designed to cripple Niger's economy. As Vox put it to quote, ECOWAS closed the borders between Niger and ECOWAS countries, instituted a no-fly zone for commercial flights in and out of the country, froze the country's assets in ECOWAS central banks and commercial banks, and instituted a travel ban and asset freeze for those involved in the coups and their families. The reaction from Nigeria was even more brutal. On August the 4th, nine days after President Bazoum was placed under house arrest, the BBC reported that Nigeria had cut power supplies to its hunter-ruled neighbor. With Niger reliant on Nigeria for 70% of its energy needs, the effects were immediate and catastrophic. Blackouts plunged major cities into darkness, entire sectors of the economy just ground to a halt. Still, the major threat for the hunter isn't power cuts or frozen assets. It's that ECOWAS will do for Niger what it did for the Gambia six long years ago. Or will it? As we said in the opening, we're recording this on a Wednesday, a handful of days after the original deadline the bloc gave Niger to restore democracy. So far, there's been no military action. Indeed, some ECOWAS officials now seem to be signaling that an intervention is the last thing they want. Per the BBC, Abdul Fattah Musa, ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, said an armed intervention would be a last resort. Currently, the plan is for ECOWAS to hold an emergency meeting this Thursday, that's August the 10th. It'll probably have happened by the time this video goes out. There is there, it's assumed, that they'll weigh up their options. Yeah, the lack of action so far doesn't mean war is now impossible. Speaking to Deutsche Welle, geopolitical analyst Ovegwe Igugu claimed that, quote, the likelihood of a major intervention is very, very high because there are so many factors that speak for it. It's this swirling mix of factors from history to personality to regional politics that we'll be analyzing in the next chapter. So if you need a quick explainer on why ECOWAS is so determined to undo the Niger coup, look no further than the recent history of military takeovers in West Africa. Since 2020, Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso have all been seized by military hunters, with Burkina Faso famously suffering two coups in a single year. This is on top of failed coups in other West African nations like Guinea-Bissau. Taken together, they suggest democracy has become unstable, not just in ECOWAS's territory, but across the entire Sahel region. A strip of land running nearly 6,000 kilometers from Africa's west to east coasts, the Sahel is the place where the heat and sand of the Sahara give way to the savannas' rolling plains. A place that, even before recent events, was already struggling with the twin pressures of climate change and explosive population growth. To that grim list, we can now add repressive military rule. 
With the coup in Niger, the Sahel now represents an unbroken band of hunters and dictatorships from Guinea in the west to Eritrea in the east. According to the New York Times, that makes it, quote, the longest corridor of military rule on earth. What makes this particularly painful is that Niger was meant to be different. The one oasis of democracy in a human rights desert. With the peaceful transition of power to Mohamed Bazoum in 2021, the assumption was that the nation was on an upward trajectory. After all, Bazoum oversaw an economy that went from stagnation to 7% growth. More importantly, he also oversaw a sharp improvement in security. Like many nations in the Sahel, Niger is a place troubled by Islamist terrorism. Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, and Islamic State are all active in its remoter regions. 2022 alone saw something in the region of 214 separate attacks. Notably, though, the number of successful attacks sharply dropped under Bazoum. Deaths from extremism in 2022 were half what they'd been in 2021. At the same time, military-ruled Mali and Burkina Faso saw their own numbers skyrocket. According to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, 90% of all extremist incidents in the Sahel last year took place in those two nations. So you can probably see why ECOS felt so affronted by Tichiani's coup. Yes, Niger was poor. Yes, it was troubled. But it was also something else, a success story other regional democracies could point to and say, you see, our system does work. Perhaps the most galling part is that Niger's democracy was crushed for spurious reasons. While General Tichiani has claimed it was anything from anti-colonialism to the security situation that inspired his takeover, the reality seems to be much more prosaic. President Bazoum was apparently on the cusp of firing Tichiani. Instead of accepting a golden handshake and quietly going away, Tichiani instead decided to bring the whole nation to its knees. Still, we shouldn't assume the Ecoist reaction has been driven solely by ideals. There are also the domestic considerations of its most powerful leader. That leader, and current chair of Ecoas, is Bola Tinubu, and he just happens to be the head of Ecoas's largest economy, Nigeria. We say just so happens because Tinubu is extremely new to the job. He only assumes the presidency of Nigeria on May the 29th of this year, less than two months before the coup. Nonetheless, he's said to be determined to both put an end to the military takeovers in ECOWAS and return Nigeria to its rightful position as a regional power. As security expert for Hiraman Kone told Deutsche Welle, Tinubu wants to reaffirm Nigeria's leadership and its military, financial, and diplomatic strength in the region. Given his already public views on the recent string of coups in West Africa, Niger is a perfect outlet for such ambition. As another expert told The Times, Tinubu is taking this Niger crisis personally. This personal involvement on Tanubu's part could be key to any future intervention in Niger, not least because Nigeria is the obvious place from which to launch military action. With a 1,600-kilometer border running between the two nations, Nigeria is the only plausible start point for a campaign. The only other ECOWAS members that border Nigeria are either suspended and sympathetic to the new junta, like Mali and Burkina Faso, or share only a tiny border with it, like Benin. That makes the position of Nigeria's president perhaps more important than any other member of the bloc. But while we've spent these last two chapters focusing on ECOWAS, we need to be clear that they're not the only player where Niger is concerned. So it's time for a quick dive into the tangled relations three other major powers have with Niamey. Three non-African nations with huge stakes in how the coup plays out. We're talking, of course, about France, America, and Russia. Since most of you watching this statistically are American, discussing the USA's role in Niger seems like an obvious place to start with this chapter. Because while you may have barely ever heard of Niger before the coup, make no mistake, Niamey has played a key part in US foreign policy for years. As a country sat right in the heart of the Sahel, Niger has a front row seat to the chaos caused by Islamist terror groups. According to studies, something in the region of 40% of all violent activity carried out by these actors in Africa takes place in the Sahel. That makes Niger the perfect place from where to gather intelligence and conduct counter-terrorist operations against these groups. Hence the two drone bases the United States built and operates in Niger. Hence, too, the generous assistance and aid package Uncle Sam has earmarked for the country. No other country in West Africa gets as much American money as Niger. The coup stands to undo all of this. 
Not only has the junta effectively spat in Washington's face, U.S. law also makes it impossible to keep supplying aid to any nation that has undergone a military takeover. With the generals also reveling in anti-American rhetoric, it's currently hard to see how the Pentagon can maintain its drone bases in Niger. Even if losing them will cripple Washington's ability to fight international terrorism, as Al Jazeera summed it up with remarkable understatement, this is a major setback for Washington. Not that America is the Western power most damaged by the coup. No, that honor probably goes to France. France. Like Washington, Paris has military personnel stationed in Niger who help with counterterrorism operations. Unlike the Americans, though, the French also have a long and complicated relationship with the Sahel region that was once seen as a key to Paris's ability to project power. By the New York Times' count, nearly half of all modern African countries spent some of their history as French colonies or protectorates. This includes enormous swaths of West and North Africa regions where many still speak French to this day. Known collectively as Franc Afrique, many of these countries kept close ties with their old colonial overlord after independence, a web of often murky political and economic ties that often worked for Paris's benefit. To take one example, look no further than uranium. Despite accounting for only 4% of the world's uranium exports, way, way behind Kazakhstan's 43%, Niger sells tons of the stuff to France. A full fifth of Paris's uranium needs are sourced via Niamé, often at favorable rates. This uranium is crucial for keeping France's 56 nuclear reactors online, the source of the nation's energy independence. So important are Niger's resources that the 90% state-owned Orano operates three mines in the country on Paris's behalf. With the coup, Niger has now joined the Legion of Nations in franc Afrique that are suddenly turning on their former colonizer. In 2022, Mali ordered French troops to leave its territory after nine years of counter-terror operations. In early 2023, Burkina Faso followed suit. Now Niger is also pushing Paris to the exit, a perhaps fatal blow to France's claims to be a great military power. More disturbingly for a non-French audience, though, is who they might invite in to replace them. Now, back in the first chapter today, we mentioned how pro-coup protesters had attacked the French embassy in Niamey, some of them waving Russian flags. This came on top of previous anti-French protests, where people have chanted things like down with France and long live Putin and Russia. Few experts believe that the Kremlin directed or helped the junta pull off its coup. As War on the Rocks recently explained, this should be seen as more evidence of how being pro-Russian has come to be linked with being anti-France for many in Paris's former colonies. To quote, being anti-West, specifically anti-France, and pro-Russia is an increasingly prominent feature of African populism. But just because Vladimir Putin wasn't personally directing General Tichiani's takeover doesn't mean Russian elites can't benefit from the coup, specifically Russian elites with ties to the Wagner Group. Since Mali's military takeover in 2021, Wagner fighters have been active in the nation and neighbor of Niger. Over the last few days, Niger's junta have likewise met with Wagner representatives. If Wagner establishes a foothold in Niamey, it will be the fourth Sahel nation to fall under the group's sway after Mali, Sudan, and the Central African Republic. If its previous track record is anything to go by, this will lead to epic human rights abuses, the murder of civilians, and resource plundering on a scale that will make uh, France's uranium extraction look rather quaint. These, then, are the hopes and fears of the three most significant non-African nations involved in Niger. Three nations that can either see disaster or opportunity on the horizon depending on how the coup plays out. And these are only the most engaged. We've not even had time to talk about Turkey's arms sales to Niger or China's commercial interests in the country. For now, though, we're going to leave the background explainer behind and turn our attention to the most important question of all. What comes next? Will there be a military intervention and what's it going to look like? The potential answers range all the way from there's no intervention to uh, this one who sparks a West Africa wide war. Because of the lag time between us recording this and you watching it on YouTube, it's possible that ECOWAS has already taken steps to intervene in Niger, possibly with Western backing. If that's the case, then you already know whether or not ECOWAS was serious about following through with its threat. Even so, it may not yet be clear how things are going to unfold, because from where we're sitting, it looks a whole lot like there are three possible outcomes. Diplomacy works, the intervention is bodged, or the entire region plunges into catastrophic conflict. On the diplomacy works side of the ledger, there are the reassuring comments by ECOS's Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Abdel Fattah Massar, who has stated that the bloc, quote, wants diplomacy to work. To that, we can add reluctance in Nigeria to start a war with its northern neighbor. 
For all President Bola Tinubu may be pushing for intervention, he can't authorize military action without approval from Nigeria's National Assembly. Approval, it appears, he might not be able to get. On the other side of the ledger, though, there's the ongoing refusal of the junta to engage in any diplomatic process. Rather than talking, General Tichiani seems to be digging in, refusing mediation. At the same time, partner nations like the US are clearly starting to worry about Niger turning into a base for some wild combination of jihadism and Wagner mercenaries. A worry that makes inaction all but impossible. So let's assume they go for it. Let's assume that ECOWAS follow through on their promise to restore democracy as the leaders of both Nigeria and Senegal seem keen to do. What could happen next? The first thing to note is that there's no universe in which this becomes a repeat of the intervention in the Gambia. At 11,300 square kilometers, the Gambia is smaller than Connecticut. In 2017, its armed forces were woefully unprepared for serious fighting. Niger, by contrast, is about the size of Texas, California, and Oregon combined. Its army is large, battle-tested in the fight against jihadists, and highly trained by American and French special forces. On top of that, military ruled Mali and Burkina Faso have already promised to come to the junta's aid if ECOWAS invades. This raises the prospect of what former NATO Supreme Allied Commander in Europe James Stavridis has called a full-blown war in Africa. It's a scary thought. The idea that some of West Africa's most powerful militaries could be days away from open confrontation should terrify everyone. But not because anyone expects a Ukraine war scenario with two hardened armies fighting one another to a grinding near stalemate. No. The main worry about an ECOWAS intervention is how unprepared every single force involved may turn out to be. As former NSC Director for African Affairs Cameron Hudson told Politico, ECOWAS has no recent experience undertaking this kind of operation. It's not something they even train for. Even Nigeria, with the bloc's most powerful military, is hardly a superpower. Its forces have spent years fighting Boko Haram on its own soil without success. This inexperience could actually increase the risk of casualties and disasters. And not just on the ECOWAS side. On the Hunter side, Burkina Faso's military is bogged down fighting its own counterinsurgency, while Mali's military is so under-equipped that they have a single transport plane. Even Niger's coup leaders can't count on a solid performance by their troops. The specialist forces trained by the US and France are far from the capital fighting jihadists, and it's not at all clear that they feel much loyalty to the junta. The counterintuitive part here is realizing how this lack of all-round experience won't make things better should ECOWAS intervene. More likely, it will lead to what Cameron Hudson in Politico called the show scenario. The Institute for the Study of War recently assessed that, quote, regional ECOWAS forces lack the capacity for a successful peacekeeping mission. That means any intervention is likely to turn into an open-ended quagmire, one in which hunter forces, perhaps backed by Wagner, commit human rights abuses while the militaries of Nigeria and Niger severely degrade one another's capabilities. Capabilities that are desperately needed to help in the regional fight against jihadism. In their bleak assessment, the ISW painted a picture of a brutal conflict in which the armies of Niger, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and Mali are all so badly mauled that a vacuum is created, one into which jihadi groups quickly step. At best, the ability of ECOWAS to combat these threats would be badly curtailed. At worst, you might end up with a security situation akin to the last months before America pulled out of Afghanistan. Or as ISW put it, an ECOWAS military intervention would likely worsen the security situation in Niger and the region in the long term, regardless of its outcome. But then, can the bloc afford not to get involved? To lay down an ultimatum and then fail to act as the deadline goes whistling past? As we end this video then, it's with the whole of West Africa at a crossroads, one in which every road seems to point to some unwelcome destination, some worse than others go one way, and the spread of coups in the region could continue unchecked. The hunter could entrench, and Niger could become a playground for Wagner forces. Go another way, and we could see the largest military encounter the region has witnessed in years, one in which victory for either side is far from guaranteed. The only certainty in all of this is that a choice will need to be made, and soon a direction picked. And so, the fates of millions will turn on a single decision. As you're hopefully aware by now, the coup in Niger and Ecowas's reaction to it may be one of the most important stories unfolding anywhere in the world, a story that affects ordinary people as far afield as Europe or America, a story in which the next bloody chapter may be about to be written.